Our little ones are dismissed for Children's Church. As Brother Fred has already so graciously prayed for me, I would appreciate your prayers this week. I leave in the morning to fly to South America, to the great country of Peru. I'll be there for eight days and preparing a major conference for June, preparing for a wedding that I will be doing there in June, and uh, checking up on one of my student interns and hearing him preach next week. Now, in my absence next week, Brother Oren will be back, God willing, to lead the singing. And also Brother Jim Allen, many of you know and love him. He will be uh, bringing the Word of God to you next Sunday. So as you know, he is a great speaker and you'll enjoy hearing him. Then Lord willing, uh, if I get back in one piece, and I trust that I will through your prayers, I will be um, um, preaching two weeks from today, continuing Mark. I'd like to show you one picture that my students sent me. Uh, I am getting him to do PowerPoints like I do. So, uh, uh, and this is a, in Spanish, of course, God is bigger than your problems. And I love this, that just like we are this sheep and we feel like the wolf is about to get us, well, who is looking down on the wolf? The lion. And so there's no contest between a wolf and a lion. So next time you feel like your problems are going to overwhelm you, just remember, uh, the wolf's not going to get you because the lion, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, is there. So I just love this. But anyway, this is from his PowerPoint presentation in Spanish, of course. So thank you for your prayers for me next week. All you engineers out here know that there is an important step in developing any product, and that's called the stress test. Will a machine hold up under pressure when it is pushed to the limit? Oil field equipment needs to be tested. It needs to be pushed to the max to be sure it's safe and strong, when, whether it's a pipeline or any other piece of equipment. Airplane wings must be stretched to find out how, if they'll break. You see this plane here? I don't think I would ever want to be in that plane up in the air if the wing was stretched that much. I had no idea you could even stretch a plane wing that high, but it's part of the stress test. Bricks have to be uh, tested at least every so many and every thousand they make to make sure the pressure will not crush them when they're holding up a wall. Doctors use stress tests on our hearts. Our true character is proved by how much we can hold up when we are pushed to the breaking point. Last Sunday, as we began studying in Mark chapter 3, we saw how the growing antagonism toward Jesus that had been developing over the uh, past weeks uh, came to a head when he healed a man on the Sabbath. As a result, Israel's religious leaders, the Pharisees, began to plot to do away with Jesus. They joined forces with their worst enemies, the Herodians. The Herodians were a political party, corrupt politicians in uh, cronies of the King Herod's family, and so they were going to join forces to do away with Jesus. So how did Jesus respond to the stress of knowing that from this point on, there was like a mob contract on his life, not by criminals, but by the leaders, political and religious, of the nation? How did Jesus react to the pressures of being wildly popular with thousands of people flocking to him? Well, today we're going to see how Jesus responded to that kind of stress and pressure in the next passage in Mark chapter 3. So to reduce my stress level and our stress level, let's pray. And would just one of you just silently or several of you pray that this microphone will not act up again like it did last week. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Would you join me? Father, I just thank you for your word and how just reading your word can reduce our stress levels. And I just pray, Father, for any of my brothers or sisters here, my friends, who are undergoing stress in their marriage, on their job, uh, in their studies, uh, with their family, Lord, just personally in their minds or hearts, or for any other circumstances, that you would use this message to be an encouragement as we look and see how the Lord Jesus responded to pressure and as how we can, as we walk with him, we can turn our burdens over to him, even as we sang in these wonderful hymns. So, Father, now go with us and teach us through your Spirit as we study together this morning. We ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Today we begin a new section of Mark's Gospel. Now, you, most of you who see me regularly, you know I don't use a formal outline. 
Most of you have really good study Bibles, and if you look at the beginning of the Bible books and the study Bibles, they have great outlines. But you know, um, if I see too many outlines, this, uh, let's throw up our next slide, the Roman numeral I, double I, triple I, or the uh, letters A, B, C, or Roman numerals one, two, three, I feel like Clarence, the cross-eyed line in the famous TV series. I just, it just goes all blurry for me. So I don't use many of those outlines, but I do want to give you a, a much more simple outline today, uh, and let's review where we've come so far in Mark. In Mark chapter 1, the first 13 verses, these basically introduce us to Jesus as Israel's Messiah. Now, I called him, as we in this series, God's secret agent, because most people didn't know who Jesus really was. So in those first verses, Jesus is introduced to Israel. Mark introduces Jesus to his readers by John the Baptist. And so at Jesus' baptism, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit actually do reveal who Jesus is because God the Father says that Jesus is his beloved son. But then in Jesus' temptation by Satan, over 40 days he proves who he is by withstanding every temptation that Satan can throw against him. Then the early chapters of the Gospel of John we find out that Jesus had a ministry in Judea. It was a very quiet first year of his ministry. He met his first disciples. They began to serve part-time with him while working on their jobs part-time. And two famous incidents you remember, Jesus with the woman at the well, Jesus talking to Nicodemus, a very difference between this woman and this man, those private conversations, all of that is what took place in that first year of Jesus' ministry. Then in Mark chapter 1, 14, through what we studied last week, is often called the early ministry of Jesus in Galilee. He calls his disciples into full-time ministry now. He preaches. He miraculously heals. He drives out demons. And he becomes wildly popular, but with the people in Galilee, in the north of Israel. And the antagonism of the religious establishment begins to grow against him. Now today, we come finally to the next section of Mark, from chapter 3, verse 7, on through into chapter 6. And this is what people call Jesus' later ministry in Galilee. When I return in two weeks, God willing, we're going to see how he calls from that larger group of disciples 12 men to be apostles sent out like missionaries. And we're going to see how his ministry today grows not just popular within Galilee, but the whole country and even beyond. But most important in these next chapters, as we study Lord Willing in March and April, Jesus begins to polarize people more and more. They are either for him or they are against him. And we're in for some surprises as that, because when we come to Jesus' family, How is his family going to react to him? We'll see some surprises there. In our modern world, we prize neutrality as a virtue. A person who refuses to take sides in an argument is applauded for their fairness, their objectivity, perhaps being a peacemaker, and there's many occasions where that's a great thing. But no one is truly neutral. In World War II, Switzerland was praised for not taking sides or entering in the war. As you see these beautiful scenes in Switzerland, you almost expect Julie Andrews to come walking over the hill singing, the hills are alive with the sound of music. But what turned out? Switzerland that didn't take sides in the war hid millions of dollars of Nazi money in Swiss banks. So nobody is truly neutral. And the Bible tells us that before the second coming of Jesus Christ, that every man, woman, and child on earth will, on pain of death, be required to either side with Christ or side with Antichrist. So that day will come. Friends, I just want to challenge you that there are not two sides, God's side or Satan's side. There's only one side, God's. There is no middle ground when it comes to God. The man who says, I'm not going to believe one way or another, that man is rejecting God. The woman who says, I don't tell my children what to believe, that mother is condemning her kids to hell. Our choices either define us 
or our choices doom us when it comes to God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you may ask, Frank, how is it that I can choose God? That is a great question. And we choose God by believing and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, Lord, and God. That's how we choose God, by choosing His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's read how Jesus responded to the stress test of this ugly plot to murder Him in Mark chapter 3, verse 7. Jesus withdrew with His disciples to the sea, the Sea of Galilee, or we would say Lake Galilee. And a large crowd followed from Galilee, from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, beyond the Jordan, and around Tyre and Sidon. The large crowd came to him because they heard about everything he was doing. Now, this slide shows you what the Sea of Galilee looks like today. And verse 7 tells us that Jesus withdrew. This verb means to withdraw from opposition, to take refuge from danger. Jesus knew about this conspiracy that had been hatched against him to get rid of him, but he didn't run away, but he did prudently withdraw from the danger, from the conflict. He didn't hide, he stayed out in the open, but he didn't hang around either. You remember in our study last week, Jesus briefly confronted the religious leaders, but he didn't argue with them, he didn't fight them. But now he withdraws. And notice this phrase, with his disciples. From this point on in the book of, of Mark, Jesus' disciples are constantly with him unless he sends them out on a mission to preach, and then they report immediately back to him afterwards. They were constantly by his side. Brother, sister in Christ, that's our place too. Just as this said that, the, that he was with his disciples, that is our place as Jesus' disciples. Is that how you view your life as a Christian? Whether our path involves joy or sorrow, victory or defeat, Jesus is beside us, Jesus is within us, but equally important, we need to be with Him, following Him, living closely to Him. How do we do that? Well, by spending time in His Word, by talking to Him in prayer, and by consciously depending upon Him. That's a hard, hard thing to do. But what I suggest to Christians is to make a habit of whether we are driving, whether we are working, whether we are talking to frequently. I won't say how frequently because God leads us differently, but frequently just think, Lord, I'm depending on you to speak through me, to use me to be a blessing to people, to react as, in a way that would honor you, that conscious dependence upon Him, that is being with Him, following with Him. And of course, there's many other examples as well. The verb withdraw in verse 7 can also mean to retreat, like to take a break or to go on a retreat. Perhaps Jesus intended here to take a little vacation, to get away from the controversy, to spend some time with His disciples by the sea. We know how relaxing the water can be but it was to be short-lived. A large crowd from everywhere started following Jesus. The local popularity that Jesus uh, experienced in his early Galilean ministry now grows to national stardom. Many of you remember the famous rock opera, Jesus Christ Superstar. It was very super flawed theologically, but it was accurate in the sense that Jesus was famous in his time in Israel. There had not been a prophet speaking the word of God in Israel for 400 years since Malachi. John the Baptist was known all over the country, but his ministry only lasted six months until King Herod put him in prison and then executed him. So Jesus, remember, remained pretty obscure in his first year, but now he begins to be known far and wide in his second year. People came from all over to see this amazing man and what he could do. And remember, this was in the days before the internet, before TV, before newspapers and radio. I'm sure caravans and merchants, as they carried their goods across the country and even out, were saying to people, have you heard of Jesus? Do you know what he can do? And so, of course, people then came in droves to see him. Verses 7 to 8, Jesus lists, or rather Mark lists, 
these huge crowds and where they came from. And I want us to go to a map here. Here, of course, is Galilee. Here's the Sea of Galilee, Nazareth, where Jesus was born. This is North Israel. So people came from this region. They came from southern uh, Israel, Judea. Here was Jerusalem, the capital. But Mark tells us they came from beyond. 120 miles south of the Sea of Galilee was an area called Idumea. This is where the old Edomites, the descendants of Esau, lived. And, of course, King Herod and his family were from this area. We'll talk about that more in a second. Then across the Jordan East, Perea, this whole area, people came. And then way in the north, modern-day Lebanon, Tyre and Sidon. Of course, Damascus and Syria, very much in the news today. So literally, what's important here is not just people coming from within Israel, from North Galilee and from South and Judea, but from outside of Israel, people were now coming. Mark records this, I think, to show us that these areas, South, East, and North, of course, the sun always set in the West on the Mediterranean Sea, like in California, the sun always sets on the Pacific. People came from these areas outside, and those were mainly Gentile, mainly foreigners, non-Jews lived in those areas. Who were Mark's readers? Mark's readers in Rome were Gentile Christians, believers from the Roman Empire. So how thrilling it must have been for the people in Rome, Christians in Rome, to see even in Jesus' ministry, Gentiles began to seek him. Gentiles began to find him. And of course, most of us here in this room are Gentiles. What a wonderful thing that Jesus not only came to save the Jews, but he came to save us as Gentiles. But unfortunately, as we read in the next verse, most of the crowds were not following Jesus for the right reason. They were seeking a superstar Messiah who could miraculously meet their needs. They were not seeking him for the right reason. Let's look in verse 9. This is a bit frightening as we look at this. Then Jesus told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him so the crowd would not crush him. Since he had healed many, all who had diseases were pressing toward him to touch him. Mark's vivid picture here is of a big commotion. People pushing, shoving, crowding to get near enough to see, to touch Jesus. The verb crush here in verse 9, pressing toward literally falling on him, the idea is that because he's on the shore of Lake Galilee, they could have really pushed him into the water. Some people could have gotten hurt in this. So Jesus wisely tells his disciples to have this small boat ready in case he got thronged by this mob. Now think with me. This solution is so typically ingenious of the things Jesus did. This was not the big boat that the uh, fishermen like Peter used that they could uh, trawl their nets from. This was like a skiff. It was a small boat that could handle Jesus and maybe one or two other men. Basically, it was an escape pod to get away from the shore. This is a bird's eye view of what that could have looked like with all these people crowding on the shore. You say, well, why didn't they swim out? You have to remember that in ancient times and for most of history, the majority of people did not know how to swim. Our modern swimming for fun, for recreation, for sports, that did not exist in ancient times. People were actually afraid of the water. So you had to be pretty brave to be a sailor to be a fisherman, and even the fishermen, many of them didn't know how to swim, or when they fell in, you know, that was it. And so, uh, but Jesus uses this not only as an escape pod, but also as a very interesting pulpit to preach from. So extremely creative of how to deal with all these great people that came along. Verse 10, this word diseases, this is literally scourges. Are plagues, like when they scourged Jesus uh, during his trial. This is the, really the same word there. This is the most extreme form of illnesses, and Jesus, of course, was able to heal them. But notice something. The word, he had healed many. He did not heal all. This is so important. Jesus sovereignly chose to heal some people, but not all people. Throughout Scripture, just because someone has a need, that does not guarantee that God will heal them. This is very important to be clear. The most important thing is for God's will to be done. Amen. 
And sometimes God's will is for him to teach us things in an illness that he could not teach us any other way. So that when we pray, we should follow Jesus' teaching in the model prayer, our Father, and his example in the Garden of Gethsemane. Our prayer request should be specific. We should ask God to help, to heal, to deliver. But we should always qualify our prayer, as Jesus did in the model prayer, as Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane, and ask for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not my will, but God's will be done. That's not easy. But the way to get God's best is to let him make the final decision. So we should ask for things. We should ask for God to heal people, but leave it in his hands. Because sometimes, you know what happens? Instead of God healing us or that person we love, he gives his grace, he gives his mercy so that we can bring glory to him through what we suffer. We can bring honor to him as we show patience and endurance, just like Jesus did when he was on the cross. Jesus did, God did not deliver Jesus from the cross. So who are we to demand that God always deliver us? Sometimes he does, praise God. Sometimes he doesn't. But we can glorify him whether he delivers us or not, because we know ultimately he will deliver us from all disease. The most extreme afflictions these people were experiencing, of course, were demon possessions. Verse 11. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they pos those possessed fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he would strongly warn them not to make him known. Remember up to this point in Mark's gospel, who is the only person who said that Jesus is the Son of God? God the Father at the baptism. Once again, Mark is showing one of his favorite themes, really great irony. Israel's, Israel's religious leaders, they didn't know who Jesus was. And all the crowds who followed him, they didn't know who he truly was, but the demons did. So it's quite interesting that they had more insight than the people did. And so uh, what happens in this section is that the demons... Um, it, Proclaim him for more, for more than what he was. Remember, uh, in chapter 1, they call Jesus the Holy One of God. Here, they acknowledge him for his true identity, the Son of God. When we think about this conflict with the demons, please do not be deceived. Jesus was in complete control of these circumstances. We often get this idea of a great struggle that Jesus had with Satan. This was no contest. Although these creatures knew who he was, they did what he told them to do. They shut up when he told them to shut up. Jesus was not a publicity hound. He did not want the kind of free demonic publicity that these creatures were going to give him. Jesus was in control of the time and place when he revealed to the disciples and to the world who he was. I put these kids' cartoons up here because sometimes they're not quite as graphic uh, as others uh, in, in portraying something that is a little scary, such as, as demons. I want to close this morning by take, doing something that I don't usually do, and that's moving from Mark's gospel to a parallel passage in the gospel of Matthew. We are studying Mark, not Matthew, but I want us to close today by going to one of the most famous passages in, Mark's, in Matthew's gospel to show how Jesus reacted to this test of his enemies, the test of the people pressing him on all sides, and this shows what kind of Messiah what kind of God Jesus is. Matthew, let's move forward. Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 17. So Matthew has told the same story that Mark has here that we've read this morning, but this is Matthew's application. He quotes the Old Testament from the great book of Isaiah, and let's read it. So that what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul delights, I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. Same word or as Gentiles. He will not argue or shout, and no one will hear his voice in the streets. He will not break 
a bruised reed, and he will not put out a smoldering wick until he has led justice to victory. The nations, again, or Gentiles, will put their hope in his name. This is the longest quotation from the Old Testament in the book of Matthew. It comes from Isaiah 42, first four verses, and this is the first of Isaiah's four beautiful portraits of the Messiah, the suffering Savior. Most of the world's rulers insist on their own way. Remember last week we talked about hard hearts insisting on their own way? Rome was built on the motto, might makes right. What do powerful people do? Powerful people use others, abuse others, misuse others, and when they get what they want, they refuse others. Oppression and injustice are the tools that kings and presidents use, the weapons they wield to trample their opponents and to perpetuate their power, but not Jesus. Jesus was unlike any other ruler in history. Jesus did not make loud political speeches in the streets. He did not raise people's hopes with empty false promises. When his enemies schemed to uh, bring about his doom, Jesus didn't argue, he didn't shout, he didn't brawl or fight back with words or with fists. Jesus was God's son. Jesus was God's superstar, but disguised as a servant. How interesting. At his baptism and his transfiguration, God the Father quotes this passage, calling Jesus his beloved son in whom he is well pleased, in whom he delights. In contrast with the unclean spirits that Jesus silenced, Jesus has God's Holy Spirit empowering him. Jesus was humble and he was lowly. He looked out for the weak and the helpless and the downtrodden. Even the despised Gentiles found hope and justice in Jesus the Messiah. There's two images here in verse 20 that I want to close with. So beautiful. Reeds grew by the thousands in the ancient world. They were cheap and disposable. The reeds were what plastic is today. You could use a reed to make flutes, rulers, pens, all kinds of things. But they were fragile and easily broken. So what would happen if you had a flute or a pen or a little measuring rod made of a reed? If it broke, you just threw it away. You got another one. No one would ever bother to use a damaged reed. It's like these little plastic pens that we all have bunches of in our drawers of our desks at home. With one of those breaks, what do you do? You toss it and you get another one. Same picture here of the reed. There were no candles in Jesus' day. The way you lighted your home in the first century was you had an oil lamp with a wick. That's how you provided light to your home at night. When the wick in that lamp burned down, to a little smoldering stub, it began to flicker. The light dimmed, you couldn't see as well. The wick gave off stinky smoke that got in your eyes and your nose. And so what would you do when it got down to that low level? You would snuff it out, throw it away, and get a fresh wick to put in the oil. No woman would waste her time on a used up, worthless, smoldering wick, but not Jesus. Do you see the spiritual application already? Jesus won't break wounded spirits. He won't put down damaged lives. Jesus doesn't give up on people that we think are hopeless or useless. Instead, Jesus provides hope, justice, and victory, not just physically, but spiritually and eternally. And how is it that Jesus accomplishes this great feat? Because on the cross, Jesus' body was broken. His blood was shed. His life was snuffed out for you and me so that our sins could be forgiven, so that we could know him eternally in a relationship with God. Jesus endured the ultimate stress test on the cross so that he would relieve us of the pressure of bearing our own sin and our own death in hell. Forever. He bore that in our place. And God asked you to believe that he did that for you as he died on the cross. And then, of course, he arose again to prove that he was successful, that he can give us not just life now, but life eternally. And as Christians, 
Jesus is not our miracle worker to rescue us out of every mess we get into. Yes, Jesus rescues us from many messes. Praise the Lord. But Jesus is our Lord. He is our master. And as his disciples, it is our duty and privilege to stay close to him, to be with him, to follow him, not just for what we can get, but so that we can learn what his heart is like, so that the way he treats people is how we can treat people as well. That when we encounter broken lives, the smoldering, worthless, useless people that we often meet, that we will treat them just like Jesus has treated us. Because as you know, many of us here, our lives are the broken reeds and the smoldering wicks that Jesus has not thrown away, but that he can use for his glory. And just as he uses us, Uh, and he has worked in our lives, he can then use us to be those channels of blessing to reach out to the broken, to the ruined lives for his glory. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this great insight into the Lord Jesus Christ, what kind of Messiah he was, how he responded to stress and pressure. And I pray, Father, that as we encounter the stress, the pressure of our lives, of our families, of our jobs, of our school, of whatever we face, Lord, that we will learn as his disciples to react as he did for the person here who has never trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, help them to see clearly how what Jesus did for us on the cross and place their faith in him for eternal life and the forgiveness of their sins. We ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.